So um, my research is really around uh, communication. And uh, John um, Pierce said that communication is the essence, is the essence of, uh, is not only the essence of being human, but also a vital property of life. And I think in our history of, of being human, you know, there's been a lot of different communication tools we've developed to try and help us connect to other people in different ways. So here's a short history from cave paintings all the way to the um, multi-channel communication we have today with mobile phones and social networking and so forth. In my opinion, there is three important trends happening right now in communication. One is towards uh, experience capture. So, you know, we've spent a lot of time probably over the last year looking at faces across Zoom and uh, looking and, and doing video conferencing, but now people are starting to strap cameras to their heads and look at how they can capture their surroundings using 360 cameras or, you know, LiDAR scanners on their iPads and things like this. The second trend is towards more natural communication. When I first started in, in computing, you know, I was using a 2400 board modem to connect to other people, and now my apartment here in Auckland is um, has a one gigabit fiber connection. So with this huge increase in bandwidth, we can now support more natural communication and start sharing you know, high, high definition video and uh, photorealistic avatars and so forth. And then the final important trend is towards understanding. This has been building uh, systems that will can recognize our emotions from computer vision input, recognize our behaviors from cameras, and can use other sensors such as um, EEG sensors to recognize brain activity and so forth. So this means now that we can have systems that recognize um, what we're about to do implicitly rather than us explicitly having to tell the computer what we're going to do. So these three areas are very important in, in the trends in the communication field, and they really overlap in this space that we're calling uh, empathic uh, computing. So, of course, you all know what empathy is. Um, Alfred Adler, the famous psychologist, said, said that empathy is seeing with the eyes of another, listening with the ears of another, and feeling with the heart of another. And in my lab, we're focusing on empathic computing, which really has three elements. First of all, understanding, so building systems that can understand your feelings and emotions. Uh, secondly, um, experiencing, so systems that help you better experience the world of other people. And thirdly, um, sharing, so systems that help you better share the experience of others. And there are many technologies you can do to help this. So for example, with understanding, there's a lot of research done on different senses that can help you better understand the emotions of other people. With experiencing, virtual reality allows you to be immersed inside you know, somebody else's world in the uh, current day or go back in history and see what it was like living uh, hundreds or thousands of years ago. And we're using augmented reality to explore different types of uh, ways you can share communication cues. So the main research focus of my lab is, can we develop systems that allow us to share what we're seeing, hearing, and feeling with others? And we have many projects, but I just want to talk about a couple of them today that, that are typical of this. One of the first ones is the empathy glasses, and this was developed about four years ago. And we combined together three technologies, uh, a pupil lab's eye tracker, an augmented reality display, and a special pair of glasses called the effective wear that could recognize uh, your uh, face expression. And the goal of combining these together was to try and create um, the ability to share remotely the same uh, communication cues we have in a face-to-face -face setting. So be able to share eye gaze and face expression to a remote uh, collaborator. So here is a system that we put together. You can see on the left, the person wearing these glasses with the eye tracker and the face expression sensor. He also wore a heart rate sensor as well. And on the right, you can see the view that he's seeing inside the glasses. Uh, the most important thing is this, uh, or two th important things. First of all, this green dot here. The green dot is the pointer from a remote person he's collaborating with. So the remote person can move their mouse around and uh, the person who's wearing the glasses can see their mouse pointer. And then even more importantly, there's a red dot beside that. The red dot is the eye gaze of the person who's wearing the system. And this is shared back with the remote person. So this is very important because now the remote person has an implicit communication cue and he can know what the uh, collaborator is about to do before he do, does it because people always look at objects before they interact uh, with them. So the goal of this was to be able to enable the, um, people to share implicit communication cues for remote uh, collaboration. So here's a video of the system working. You'll see on the right-hand side, a person uh, arranging a picture of blocks and wearing our technology. And then on the left-hand side, this is the remote expert 
and now he's moving his uh, mouse pointer around and trying to explain to the person where to move uh, the blocks and the eye gaze is following the green pointer so the remote user can tell when the person's paying attention because the eye gaze will, will pointer will follow the green pointer um, you can also see the face expression changing and the heart rate changing as well and um, so here's all the technology uh, combined uh, together uh, this is a, the special uh, face expression sensor used uh, reflective uh, photo reflective sensors that can measure the distance to your skin on your face so when you uh, smiled or changed face expressions then um, that would be reflected with that when we conducted some user studies with this we found that the ability to have the remote pointing and especially the remote gaze cue made the two collaborators feel more socially connected and they felt that they were able to collaborate better on a task than without those uh, communication cues but one of the problems that you will notice with this is that the person who's wearing the camera um, the remote person can only see where the person who's wearing the camera is, is looking so a couple of years after that we developed a new system called the shared sphere and with this system we live streamed a 360 video view to a remote person so you have one person wearing an augmented reality display you could live stream 360 video to a remote person who's inside a virtual reality display and this means that the virtual reality user could look wherever they wanted and could see a, a, a view of the collaborator's surroundings. We also used hand tracking technology. So the person in VR could hold their hands in front of their face. And then the AI user in the real world would be able to see these virtual ghost hands appearing in front of them. And of course now, because the VR user can look in any direction, we um, want to be able to show where they're looking. And so we have this uh, virtual box appearing that shows their viewpoint. So let me show you a video of this uh, working. This is a project we did with the power company. And uh, so you can see the person there standing with the Microsoft HoloLens on and the 360 camera and looking at a very complicated uh, control panel and trying to understand it. But in their uh, AR display, they can see these remote uh, hands appearing and being able to draw annotations on the real world or point on the real world. There's also that green square which shows where the remote user is looking. So they're both looking in the same direction right now. And then we live streamed a 360 video to the remote user. So this is the remote user. And for them, they feel like they're standing in the same location as the person doing the uh, work because they share that same 360 um, video. And so they can draw on the video and make annotations and they can collaborate with the user to help them complete that task in the real world. One of the limitations of this, though, is that we only we only have a 360 video. So, so although the person feels like they're standing in the same space, they can't walk through that space. It's just a video of um, texture mapped onto a photo um, bubble. So most recently, we've looked at how we can uh, capture uh, 3D uh, depth sensing point clouds and fuse them together to create a live uh, captured 3D model of the real world. And so we're hoping that in the next few years, you'll have some sort of small handheld device and you can walk into a real location and you can immediately capture a 3D geometry of that location and share it remotely. So this is a video of this working. You can see on the left-hand side, a top-down view. The right-hand side is a first-person view. And this is live uh, 3D geometry captured from a portion of our lab. Um, in a second, you'll see one of my students walking into the space and you can see them on the left-hand side coming in as a 3D uh, model. You'll notice a lot of blue space, and this is where the cameras can't see, and so there's some occlusion there, and the flat table, the white table in the middle is supposed to be flat, but you see it's very curvy, and that's because there's some issues with the camera calibration, so there's still a lot of work to be done. But the overall vision is that we should be able to, in the near future, capture and share 3D models of our surroundings and have remote people be immersed into those models and feel like they're, they're part of that with us. So you can see over the last few years, we've gone from 2D capture to 360 capture to 3D, and which has created an increased immersion, better scene understanding and better uh, collaboration. So um, as I said before, empathic computing really involves three elements, standing, experiencing and sharing. And we've done some research in each of these areas that relate back to agents and social agents. Uh, first of all, in the understanding space, we've done some work on emotion recognition. In the experiencing space, we've done work on content capture, like I just showed you. In the sharing space, we've been looking at how you can use avatars and social agents to share different communication cues. So first of all, with, with understanding, um, you know, there are many examples now of, of, of people using intelligent agents in their lives, and many of these agents require trust. Uh, for example, you know, if you're using a self-driving car, would you trust it to drive you to your locations? In fact, according to the AAA, 
70 percent of americans would be afraid to, to ride in a fully self-driving vehicle so one of the critical aspects of this is how do you measure trust and and if you if you have an agent that is detecting that you're not trusting it maybe it will change its behavior to be more trustworthy so we did a, a project a couple of years ago looking at how we could measure trust using physiological uh, sensors a lot of people have done research on measuring trust with a variety of um, subjective measures and surveys but we thought you know could we uh, use um, EEG, uh, GSR, and heart rate sensors to be able to measure trust, and also if there's a, co a relationship between cognitive load and trust. So the main novelty was combining those sensors together to do a trust measure. And we also did this in a virtual environment with a virtual agent that would um, help you perform a task, but wasn't always uh, trust uh, worthy. So this is the experimental task. We had a person inside VR. And the goal of this person was to try and find a variety of target objects. And um, while they were searching for the target objects, they also had to complete an NBAC task, which is a recall task where you've got to recall the letters that were shown to you um, a few seconds before. And so that increased the cognitive load. And then we had uh, an agent that was telling them by voice which way to turn their head, you know, either left or right to better find the um, uh, better find the targets but the agent wasn't always reliable and so the person had to decide whether they're going to trust the agent and follow the direction or whether they were going to um, uh, do their own um, act on their own so we built an experiment that had uh, two, cog uh, two cognitive load factors a high and low cognitive task depending upon the NBAC task and also an agent that was uh, three agent conditions one with no agent at all a second agent that was only 50% accurate, and then the agent that was 100% accurate. And we had these people perform this task and we measured their uh, physiological um, uh, senses information while they're completing the task. And what we found was that, um, well, first of all, not surprisingly, uh, by measuring the EEG, we could detect the difference between the cognitive load. But we also found that if we looked at the um, GSR and the heart rate variability, when we did some processing of the data using fast Fourier transforms, we could notice a significant di difference in the mean and peak frequency depending upon the agent trustworthiness. So we could indeed, by using those physiological cues, detect whether the person was trusting an agent or not. And then uh, people perform better with a more accurate agent, not um, surprisingly. So overall, we found that you know, for virtual agents, um, we can um, have a more accurate measure of trust using a combination of physiological cues, uh, performance, and subjective uh, measures. So the next thing I want to talk about is experiencing and sharing those experiences. And we did a project with in, interacting with a, a, um, a real robot. And the goal was to be able to use a depth sensor to capture the surroundings of the robot and then use VR to control the robot. And so basically um, taking a virtual copy of the robot and dragging its effectors around and having the real robot uh, match that. And we wanted to be able to use the scene capture to create increased situational um, awareness so we would be more aware of what's around the robot. So we created uh, a mixed reality scene that had three variations. The, the first was a purely virtual reality scene. The second was a point cloud um, of the surrounding robots and the robot. And then we combined the two together to create a mixed reality scene that combined a virtual reality model of the robot with a point cloud. So I'll show you a, a, a video of this uh, working. So what you'll see in this video it's a person putting their VR headset on, and then in front of them, they're able to see this um, armed robot. And then they can, uh, with the VR controller, they can move the controller around and they can, uh, the robot will, will, will match the motions with its end um, effector as well. And we looked at a variety of uh, conditions with different types of movements for the robot and also the effect of different types of uh, visualizations of, of seeing the point cloud was if improved the situation awareness or not, or seeing the virtual model of the robot. And it, it turned out the best combination was to see a, a virtual model of the robot embedded in a point cloud of the real uh, world. So this is an example of how you might be able to use scene capture, like I showed you before, to improve your interaction with an agent, in this, in this case, a, a real um, uh, ro robot. So here's an example of interacting uh, purely in the VR um, setting. But this proved to be less effective because you couldn't see the real world. And so you didn't know when the robot end effect was enclosed to real objects and things like that. The third element we've been looking at is, is sharing virtual communication cues. 
and, uh, and looking at how we can use VR and AR to share communication cues and, and cues like gaze, gesture, head pose, or body position, and also sharing uh, the same copy of the real world. So the idea is you have somebody in the real world who can uh, scan their surroundings and then see, send a copy of their surroundings to a remote collaborator. The remote collaborator can go into VR and feel like they're in the same world with that person. And then we can uh, have a collaboration between an AR and a VR user and, and use a variety of communication cues. And in this case, the communication cues, first of all, both people were represented as these uh, pink headed uh, avatars. And they also had uh, hand gestures they could show, but we also wanted to explore how we could show a view for us from communication cues. So one of the challenges we have when we're talking face to face with people is that when you turn away from their face, you can't see where they're looking anymore. But inside VR and AR, you can provide some, provide some virtual cues that show um, communication cues we don't have in the real world. And in this case, for example, we put a, a pyramid view frustrum on the person's head. And now when I'm looking away from them, if I can still see that view frustrum, I know where the person is, is looking. We also explored how we could add some uh, gaze cues as well. So with eye tracking, we could know where they were looking and we could have a gaze line or we could look at the head gaze, so the head pointing cue. So we had these four conditions, a baseline condition with no extra communication cues, a field of view condition with, with the pyramid showing a head gaze cues with head gaze line and eye gaze cues. So here's a video of the system working. On the left, you can see the real environment. The right is a digital copy of it. This is what you'd see in the AR view, this virtual character superimposed over the real world. And those pink lines are the uh, view frustration that's coming out from that uh, character. And so now, even though I can't see the character's face, I could see what the um, character is looking at. And then in this task, we had to collaborate together to try and find uh, cubes with certain uh, letters and numbers on them and position them in the uh, real uh, world. So you can see on the left-hand side, the AR view, the right-hand side, the VR view, and the bottom, what's happening in the real world, we both were working together without being able to see um, each other. And overall, what we found was that, um, Having a uh, head or eye gaze pointing was far better than having no communication cues at all. And, um, and actually using those pointing cues, head pointing or gaze pointer, reduced the need to, for people to make um, hand um, uh, gestures. Um, we also found that um, having those cues together provided a higher degree of co-presence. Um, but there was no difference between head gaze or eye gaze in terms of that communication cue. So having that view frustration with the communication cue was um, just enough. One of the things though, when you're collaborating in a situation like that, is that when you look away from the um, partner, you can't see them anymore. So you can imagine a situation like this, where you've got two people in a VR environment collaborating together, or you know, it could be a, a, a two real people or a person and an, an agent. And when one of the people moves or turns around, the, the woman now can no longer see uh, the man's uh, face because he's behind her. And so we wanted to think about what happens when you can't see your colleague or your, the agent that's in the, the VR environment with you. So we had this idea of separating out the uh, communication cues from the representation of the agent. So normally you've got to look at the agent to see their gestures and face. And if you look away, you can't see those anymore. But we created this interface called the Mini-Me. And the idea is when you look away from the virtual character, you'll see a miniature version of the virtual character still attached to your field of view, um, always pointing at the same real location as the large character. And so when you lose sight of the, the, the life-size character, min the miniature avatar appears, and it provides those same communication cues that you'd have from the large uh, character, uh, including redirected gaze and um, gestures. And this could be really useful, especially in cases where you're using a um, augmented reality display with a VR co collaborator, because many of the augmented reality displays have a quite small field of view. And if you, it's very really hard to see a virtual uh, collaborator at the same time as the um, AR uh, content that you're trying to work with. So here's a video of the system working. So here's the problem with limited field of view. You can look at objects on the table and see the AR enhancements, but you can't see the character at the same time. And you can look at the character and you can't see the objects on the table. So with our, our interface here, when you look away, you see this little miniature guy appear who's pointing at the same location as in the real world as a large uh, character. So uh, you can imagine the scenario I showed you before with the woman looking on the, the, the shelf. And now the little 
miniature character appears on the shelf pointing to that same location because the life-size avatar is, is behind her and so um, the mini me just automatically appears when you turn away from the life-size um, agent so you've got an agent there you turn away and the little mini me appears and starts pointing to locations in the real world and shows the same behaviors and uh, gestures and face expressions as the uh, life-size um, character so the key innovation of this is that we separate out those communication cues that are normally shown on a um, avatar uh, body and we show them anyway if, even if you can't see the avatar so we uh, completed a user study with this and we had uh, people um, perform two tasks in, in pairs. One was an asymmetric task where one person had more knowledge than the other and they and had, had to help them solve a, a puzzle task. And the second was a symmetric task where they both had the same knowledge. And what we found was that um, using the mini-me significantly improved our task performance times. It also improved the social presence. And um, in both tasks, people preferred the interface situation where you had the, the mini me and, and the first task, the asymmetric task, three quarters of the people, and the second task, still over 60%. One of the users said the ability to see the small avatar enhanced the speed of solving the task because they could better understand the communication with their, their partner. So one of our goals of our lab is to try and create the impression that you're able to share the experience of another person. So you, you could imagine you know, maybe um, mountain in the Olympic Games, uh, a person mountain biking down the side of a mountain and using some technology to be able to live stream their surroundings to a remote person and they would feel like they're on the bike. And also we could use the ability to capture um, their physiological cues and send them as well. So we haven't quite got there yet, but we want to be able to simulate that. So we built a, a VR experience where you could have one person who's playing a VR game and they would be able to live stream their uh, position and view to a, a second person who's the observer and also the, they were wearing a special pair of uh, gloves biometric gloves that would um, capture their heart rate and share their heart rate so we want to be able to see if sharing those physiological cues would enhance the excitement or the experience of the person who's um, observing um, from the, what um, what the person's doing so we tried a couple of vr environments one was this butterfly uh, world where um, a very calm uh, scene where uh, you would be able to um, catch butterflies and the second one was this um, uh, zombie attacking game so you're in this very dark scaring you environment and you have to um, fight off uh, these uh, zombies so in both cases we want we want to play um, or share uh, these um, heart cues so when I play the video, you'll hear the sound of a beating heart and you'll see an icon beating as, as well. And this is the, the heart and the, um, the heart rate of the person who's playing uh, the game. And um, so you can see here. Research, we explore the effects of sharing physiological states of players in collaborative virtual reality gameplay. Our goal is to improve and enhance users' empathy among collaborators, especially in a remote setting using advanced computer interfaces. To support this study, we developed a collaborative VR framework which shares the player's position and heart rates with the observer in a virtual environment. The observers view the game from the player's position, but can rotate their head freely to look around. The player's heart rate is measured by a biometric glove. The measured heart rate is shared with the observer using both visual and physical cues. We developed two games based on this framework. The first game provides a calm and pleasing experience where the player catches butterflies while surrounded by nature. The second game presents a scary and stressful situation where the player tries to survive zombie attacks. We conducted a study to learn the effects of displaying the player's heart rate to the observer. From the insights gathered in this study, we present a set of guidelines for designing collaborative VR experiences. So in, in the study, I should first of all mention that when we first started doing this experiment, we uh, slaved the view of the um, observer directly to the uh, player. So as the player was turning their head around, the observer would see that head motion and, uh, and experience that in the headset. 
And that was a, a very bad idea because very quickly we discovered that the observer was getting motion sick because of course they weren't following and, and doing the same motions as the player. So in the uh, we quickly changed the experience. So we now put the position of the observer in the same virtual body as the player, but let the observer look around freely with a separate point of view than the player. So the orientation was still set and that removed the simulator sickness. But both people felt they were standing in the same place in the same body. And then when we shared that heart rate, the um, observer reported that they felt um, their um, excitement and arousal level rising as the person got more excited. We didn't notice a change in heart rate, but we did notice a change in the uh, feeling of connection with the other person and feeling of arousal, like I said. In a follow-up study though, we explored what would happen if you didn't just share the heart rate of one person to another inside VR, but what happens if you enhanced it? And so we um, had people in the same VR environment and we artificially enhanced the player's heart rate to the uh, observer and we wanted to see if we could make the observer feel more or less excited while the player's heart rate wasn't changing um, at all and um, we looked at how the heart rate could be either 20 percent faster or 20 percent slower and what we found is that by doing this we uh, affected the perceived valence and arousal levels of the other person so the person who was listening to the heart rate of the person who was I'm sharing it, uh, felt that they were getting more aroused or less aroused. Um, their own heart rate didn't change, or there was a slight trend towards significance there, but there was a big environmental impact. Um, so when we went through different VR environments, we uh, there was a big um, impact on the type of environment they were in on the heart rate. One of the other interesting things we found was that, um, of course, there are many ways you could share that um, heart rate information. In the video I just showed you, there was a beating heart icon and the sound appearing. It turns out that people really don't like seeing that beating heart icon. What they really want to, um, so in the, this version of the system, we had the heart rate sound appearing and also using the VR controller, we could pulse the controller and um, find a, a, a provide some haptic feedback. And people really felt that was a really effective way of showing the other person's heart rate. They felt like their heart was in the person's hand. This led us to some other research around exploring um, enhancing um, emotion. And so in um, many situations, uh, people online are portrayed by avatars or virtual characters. And so we want to look at how we could take physiological cues from a person and then take some contextual cues and use that to uh, uh, display more positive or negative emotions depending on the contextual cues. So for example, if the person is looking at a picture, that is supposed to make them uh, feel uh, scared. Um, we can take their uh, physiological cues and we can add some um, arousal and valence um, manipulation to it that will make the avatar of the person look more scared than they might necessarily be. So this is used to try and enhance emotion representation and make it easier for another person to perceive the emotional state of the person who's um, using the system. So let me show you a video of this uh, working. So what you'll see in this um, video is, um, hang on a second. There's a local person who's wearing a VR headset and um, they are um, watching the remote user. The remote user's using a, a laptop and, and using computer vision to track their uh, face expression. And so we map their face expression onto an avatar, but we also modulate that depending on the uh, contextual cues and the emotional, emotional state that the person is being put into. And so we, we show them a set of images that are designed to uh, change um, their emotional state. And then um, we uh, take the expression um, from the cameras and use that to drive an avatar and then modulate the avatar by um, that emotional um, state. So, um, so this is the setup. You can see here the person with the camera for, for their face. This is the face tracking. And then this is the detected face and the avatar expression here. And then we have many facial action units that we change depending on the emotional state. Um, this is very early results. We've just um, barely uh, finished 
well, developed the system about two or three months ago. And so you can see um, here, this is the result coming from the face tracking. The person is slightly frowning a little bit, but um, the uh, pictures and the context they're in are supposed to provide a positive effect. So we combine their face expression with the positive effect, and then the avatar on the right-hand side looks a little more happy than the person on the left-hand side. So let me show you a video of this working. You can see, um, again, on the left-hand side, um, the, um, that's the, the, the real face expression from the, um, captured from the camera. And then we have the uh, modulating uh, expression in the middle and the final expression that appears on the right-hand side. We're just in the process now of doing some uh, studies with this to see if this provides um, a, a more useful communication cue for emotion than uh, just looking at the person's real face as well. But uh, based on this, we decided to explore a bit more other ways you could try and create an emotional connection between people. And we got very interested in um, using EEG. And there's a phenomenon that was start, people started to explore about 10 or 15 years ago called brain synchronization. And it turns out if you have two people wearing EEG uh, caps, uh, when they do a physical task, then uh, sometimes the electrical signals or the phase of electrical signals in the EEG caps become synchronized. And uh, when that happens, the people report feeling more connected to each other and being able to communicate and, and collaborate better. So you can see in this case, you've got two people wearing EEG caps and they're pointing, they're doing a finger tracking task. So one person is pointing their finger at the other and then they're going to start moving their hand around and the goal is for the other person to hold their hand in, um, in place. So when they start doing this task, uh, you can measure their uh, brain activity. And so this is the brain activity actually before they start doing the task. You can see the black dots um, on the head there, which is where the EEG is, and it's a heat map of brain activity. And then they do the finger tracking task for a minute or so, and then they stop tracking the fingers and they, uh, point the, and they point their fingers back at each other again. So this time they're not moving. And what you see in that case is uh, this type of brain activity. And where those uh, loops are is where uh, you've got two electrodes that are in sync with each other. And so the, uh, the, the phase of the brain activity is synchronized. So that's a very interesting um, uh, experience. And we decided we want to try and reproduce that inside uh, virtual uh, reality. And it turned out nobody has done this before inside uh, VR. So we wanted to see that you know, when you couldn't see the real person, uh, but only you could see an avatar of the real person, if that would still pr provide that same brain synchronization. So here's our setup for this. Of course, now, because uh, we are um, sitting in VR, we don't need to look at the person anymore. And then inside the VR environment, you would see this. You'd see an avatar across the, the room from you. And you could do that same finger tracking task where your goal was to try and move your hand around and have the avatar um, ha and match the motions of your colleague's avatar. But one of the very interesting things about VR, of course, is that you can, um, uh, you can inhabit somebody else's body. And so in uh, another version of the experiment, we put both people inside the same body. And so now you can see in this case, when you look down two pairs of hands and um, now both people have the same perceptual cues and again they, they try and uh, complete that same uh, finger tracking or hand tracking uh, task. So our theory was that because they both have the same perceptual cues from a different perspective now of course then that may an, an increase the brain synchronization and, feel, and make people feel even more connected uh, to each other. And so what we did is measured the brain activity. Again, this is uh, before they start doing the task. Uh, these are the two brains. The red dots show the electrodes that we're measuring. These blue lines here are, are basically noise in the system. So even when you when your people aren't actively synchronized up, there's uh, just by chance there are some uh, brain uh, uh, the electrodes um, synchronized, some of the signals in the electrode synchronized. So this is before we start the activity, and then this is after the activity, and now you see some very strong um, red bands appearing, and this shows um, electrodes that have multiple connections that are synchronizing uh, together. So we've um, found that um, we can indeed create that same brain synchronization in virtual reality. 
And now we're conducting some follow-on studies. Uh, one of the great things about virtual reality, of course, is that you can modify the uh, virtual scene. So we're doing an experiment now to see what happens with what's the relationship between eye gaze and brain synchronization. And in this case, you can have two virtual avatars that do a finger tracking task, but you could uh, uh, use eye tracking and then have situations where your collaborator would either, your eyes would always look at you um, or they would always avert from you or they would have a more natural gaze. And so, you know, there's some theories that maybe one of the reasons why brain synchronization happens is because people can perceive the eye gaze of their partner and that helps them get into a synchronized um, state. So you can see we've done a lot of different uh, research around different elements of empathic computing. And you might ask, well, how does that relate uh, to uh, social agents and, and where we're going in the future? So it's very, very hard, of course, to uh, predict um, the future. But there is a trend towards more um, avatar-based uh, communication and collaboration. So here's a typical uh, VR scene where you've got people uh, remotely um, uh, collaborating together. And of course, with the current uh, pandemic, this is becoming increasingly com common. And in this case, you typically have a human-driven uh, avatars where you have uh, real people that will be driving some virtual characters that um, uh, show communication uh, behaviors. But as you've seen from what I've shown you, this doesn't have to be the case. So I've shown you examples now of how you can use uh, virtual cues to um, enhance uh, communication and show communication cues that you don't necessarily have in the real world. I've shown you how we can have avatars that show enhanced emotion over what you're really showing, um, using AI systems to, um, to recognize uh, when you're trusting or not, creating a mini-me's and, and different versions of avatars that communicate with you, uh, brain synchronization that lets you feel connected to other people, and also um, scene uh, capture. So you could imagine all of these research um, uh, being combined together to create uh, new types of social agents that are more empathic and that can uh, try and, uh, and create a uh, emotional connection with you or try and help you better communicate with another real person. And so there's an opportunity for research in what might be um, called empathic social um, agents where you can use agents to create empathy between people. And here's an example, if I just put to play here, you can see here we have this very realistic uh, character that is uh, capable of displaying emotion. And you can imagine if you could combine uh, scene capture with shared telepresence, like I showed you, with trust and emotion recognition, enhanced communication cues. And if you're able to separate emotional um, cues from representation, you could then also facilitate brain synchronization and perhaps create new types of collaborative experiences that go far beyond just um, having simple avatars uh, talking to each other or simple social agents that are in um, VR environments. So that character I showed you is from a New Zealand company called um, Soul Machines. And um, they um, are developing brains for um, characters that can um, display emotions and recognize emotions. So let me just show you a little, a little bit longer video showing what they've been doing currently. Um, sorry, let me just go to the next page. So these characters look very realistic, but in many cases, they're quite deceptive because the characters don't have much awareness of their surroundings or of, of your emotional state or um, of contextual cues. And so there's a really great opportunity to be able to take this type of AI-driven characters and then combine them with some of the 
research that I've been showing you about how you can uh, build characters now or social agents that are more aware of your emotional state, that are more aware of your surroundings, and that deliberately try and work with you to try and create a deeper sense of communication and um, connection. So just to finish up, um, I've, I've talked to you today about how in communication there's this trend towards empathic computing and you know the um, com which is a combination of technologies that support natural collaboration that support uh, capturing your surroundings and experiences and support implicit understanding and those elements of understanding experiencing and capture um, understanding experiencing and sharing um, enable us to create new types of um, shared communication experiences and so there's very many applications in social agents uh, this for building agents that can uh, recognize if you trust them or not or create um, enhanced situation awareness or convey richer communication cues but there's also many directions for future research so there's a lot of research that needs to be done on how you can more accurately recognize emotion how you can convey emotional state and enhance emotionals. Uh, there's a lot of interesting social neuroscience research can be done in areas like brain synchronization that I showed you. And also in areas like empathic teleexistence where you uh, uh, create, create the feeling of a person that they're inside the body of somebody else and sharing their real experience. So people can go from being uh, collaborators to being um, to having a, ex implicit teleexistence experience where they feel like they, they're really participants with you in the real world. And I think social agents can play a key role in this because they can help create a very strong shared emotional and empathic experience. So that's everything I wanted to say to you today. Um, here are my uh, contact details. Um, if this is what I've shown you is interesting, I'm certainly happy to share the slides with you and I'm, I'm very happy to answer your questions now. Um, as I said at the beginning of the, um, the talk, um, we don't do much research in my lab in uh, social agents. But I think the technology we are doing has huge applications in that area. So we'd certainly be very excited about exploring how we could collaborate and connect to more people in the field that are doing research um, in that area. So thank you very much uh, for your time. And I'm certainly happy to take some questions um, now. Thank you, Mark, for the great talk. Um, yeah, so the audience, if you have any questions, then uh, you can use the, um, the Q&A um, um, box under below you can see or i think uh, attendees can also raise your hand so while the audience is preparing for the question i will start with uh, my first question so uh your mini me um the research was really interesting because it basically can have two avatar one is a very small one in front of the other people's um the view from them so um, um, when I thought uh, when I thought that the research, I thought that uh, um, that uh, the representation of the author may not have to be the human like, so it could be uh, more like symbolic, uh, um, um, a geometry. So um, so did you have any experience with uh, that? Um, we um haven't we in this particular case we didn't look at non-human like um, avatars we have done some others that have done that but you're completely right um and in fact having a human character may actually um detract from the uh communication uh, cues uh, for example with that scaled down human character it's actually quite hard to perceive the face expression but we could have a cartoon like character that um uh shows that same face expression in an exaggerated way making it much easier to perceive that so i think there's a very interesting area of research being done in, in terms of what are the communication cues that are critical to con convey uh, for example in the other experiment i showed you with the um the view frustrum we thought that being able to convey gaze cues may improve the collaboration but it turned out for that task having the the eye tracking uh, didn't really improve the collaboration because People just need to know um, uh, at, a, at a more coarse level where somebody's looking. So you could easily imagine an example of a mini-me where instead of having a lifelike miniature character, you have some sort of cartoon character, or maybe you just have a pair of hands and, and head uh, floating um, as, as well. So one of the ideas that, that research was that there's no need to realistically represent or, or only use the life-size avatar to convey communication cues. You could do it in other ways. So there's certainly some good follow-on research we could do in that direction 
That's a great question. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions from the other, other audience? Uh, hi, Professor Mark. Yeah, I'm Shu Hui from Xiamen University. So thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, my question is like recently, everyone is talking about uh, metaverse or meta human, and uh, <coughs> everyone thinks about the movie like uh, <coughs> one. So, how, how do you think about this? I mean, I think it's, I mean, from researchers' point, it's still difficult to build a realistic uh, avatar or like a, a, a metaverse. So, yes. so, like, how soon do you? expect a metaverse to be part of everyone's life like facebook and twitter yeah I, I well mean, I, I think it's um i mean i certainly i think it's possible to build quite realistic avatars and, and the videos i showed of soul machines are some examples of that they visually they're realistic but you know they don't necessarily yeah. have completely realistic behaviors um in terms of the metaverse I, I guess what you're talking about is some sort of pervasive always available 3d in, environment and there are a number of companies uh, working on that in particular, Facebook with their Horizon project, they've had that running for, I think, since March or, or February last year. And there are now tens of thousands of people that can go online at the same time and have a shared uh, VR ex experience. One of the challenges, though, is that um, you have different companies working in that same space, but they all have their own standards and there's no interoperability. So, you know, you, it's, it's almost like you're building a road network but when you go from one city to the other city, you have to change cars because your car doesn't work on the other person's roads. So you've got, you know, um, Horizon is doing its, its work. Um, the rec room in um, uh, the US, they just uh, became, um, uh, achieved a billion dollar uh, valuation. So they're one of the latest uh, VR unicorn companies. Um, Microsoft has the Outspace VR. So you have a number of, these online social experiences. But, you know, I can't take my avatar from Outspace and then go into the rec room and have that same avatar. They don't talk to each other. So I think that's one of the large, what's one of the main limitations to having this um, metaverse that's pervasive is that um, there needs to be um, more interoperability standards that allow people to connect with whatever um, uh, hardware or, or, or VR software or that they're using. And I suspect you'll see that happening in the next few years. The, the reason why Facebook is, has such a huge, um, such a huge investment into VR is because they really believe that, um, you know, within our lifetimes, there will be these online pervasive VR environments that will have hundreds of millions of people using it at the same time. And so they're um, spending billions of dollars in VR research and development to make that uh, possible. So I think, you know, as I said, I think now you can definitely have a metaverse-like experience by trying some of these early systems that, you know, if you go to Outspace VR, you can easily have hundreds of people in the space at the same time and doing big social events. And then within five or 10 years, you'll be able to have these pervasive VR experiences with uh, millions and millions of people in them. One of the interesting things, though, from the, this community's perspective is that those uh, metaverse environments won't just need to be populated by real people, but they'll need to be populated by social agents that can encourage collaboration and communication and support the actions of real people. So potentially there's a huge research opportunity there to create or explore what those characters should be like. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. No problem, thanks for the question. Right, so um, so I have a, uh, actually uh, have another question. Um, so while I read your uh, bio, I learned that uh, you got the uh, Ismar Career Impact Award, which I know mm -hmm. is very uh, prestigious, in recognition for lifetime contribution to air research and commercialization. And especially, I was wondering, like I was interested in to hear more about your history or story about commercialization of your uh, research in AR, because uh, many people say that AR is very interesting, but you know it will take a lot of time for AR to be really uh, impact people. Sure. So yeah, so could you share your story about this commercialization? Uh, sure. So um, um, I've been very fortunate in my career to have some good uh, collaborators, and I was very lucky 
at the beginning of my career when I was doing my PhD to collaborate um, with um, Professor Hirokazu Kato from at the time Hiroshima City University, he's now at NIST in, in Japan, and he worked with me and developed the um, one of the first um, AR uh, computer vision tracking libraries called AR Toolkit that um, we made the lucky decision to release as open source. So that at the time was, uh, there were a couple of other researchers doing computer vision tracking for AR, but none of them had released their uh, code. So that was around the year 2000. And so um, that um, had a significant impact in the community because it meant now that instead of people having to spend weeks and weeks or months or even years trying to build an AR tracking system, they could just download our code and then start immediately building applications. So um, that um, uh, created a, a big positive impact in the community. And then uh, it turns out when you release software as open source, other people pick it up and port it to other platforms. And so a few years later, people started porting it to the mobile phone and, and we started seeing mobile phone and AR apps and also to the web. And we started seeing web-based AR apps. So for about five or six years, um, this helped drive a lot of innovation in the AR community until um, commercial companies um, started building their own systems. So that's one example of impact. Um, I guess that taught me a really important lesson, which is that if you want to have impact, uh, you have to uh, surround yourself by people that are smarter and more talented than what you are. And also you have to um, share your tools with the community and then they will create better experiences or more out of them what you could yourself. And then since that time in my career, I've had a number of other um, uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, firsts like that. Um, my research group in, in New Zealand in 2007 was the first one to build um, mobile AI advertising campaign. We developed some of the first AI authoring tools, um, some of the first, uh, the first mobile collaborative mobile AR game and a few other things like that. So, you know, when you're um, very early in a, in a growing field, it's, it's, it's um, if you're lucky, it's, it's quite easy to create those types of first. But it's really exciting now, though, to see how other people have taken that and have, have ran with it. And now there's actually a very large industry around augmented reality. Now, it, it may seem it's not a, a, big, a big industry, but it turns out, of course, um, if you have a mobile phone in your pocket, you can have an augmented reality experience. So now there's billions of people on the planet that can have an augmented reality experience. And there are companies like uh, Snapchat, for example, with a Snapchat lens, where they've got hundreds of millions of people every day taking videos of their faces with augmented reality and enhancements. Um, so the market is going very well, especially with mobile augmented reality. And then you've got companies like Microsoft that are, uh, um, you know, just um, were awarded a $500 million contract to build AR headsets for the US uh, Army. So, um, and that will also flow down into consumer versions. So I think you'll see more um, consumer augmented reality head mount displays as well. So the industry is growing. Um, it's not growing as fast as I would have hoped. And when I was, you know, started developing AR toolkit 20 years ago, everybody felt there was, there was going to be a big industry just around the corner. It turns out it took us a couple of decades to get to the point where we're almost around the corner, but um, I'm sure that within the next 10 years or so, you'll, you'll have a very thriving industry. In fact, the projections are that, you know, I think last year was about $8 billion of revenue for AR, and the projections are that by 2025, it'll be a 20 to $30 billion industry, which is, which is a, a very good industry to be working in. So that kind of gives you a bit of the history. Um, and as I said before, I'm just really lucky that um, I was um, able to find good collaborators at the beginning and then to see gaps in the research landscape where we could put our work and then also collaborate with companies that would uh, commercialize uh, some of that um, work. Yeah, I think I, I totally agree with that. In order to give a good impact, you should be surrounded, surrounded by good people and, uh, and share your uh, product or the research outcome to other people. Yes, definitely. Yeah. 